Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about abdominal aortic aneurysms for 30 minutes or so. Um, I do have a vested interest in abdominal aortic aneurysms. I'm quite interested in managing them. And I'm the, the clinical director of the Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland National Abdominal Aortic Aneurysm Screening Programme, or NASP. So it really is my area of expertise. Um, I, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd address this topic by looking a little bit back in history, then thinking about how we manage aneurysms today, and then covering some controversies. And, and, and hopefully throughout the course of that, there'll be some, um, some useful um, bits and pieces for, for, for you guys as GPs. I will say at this stage, if you do have a nervous disposition, I do have some slides with graphs in them, uh, but they, they do help explain what I'm trying to get 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 around. So hopefully they're not too tedious. So Albert Einstein, he um, he underwent completely unrelated abdominal surgery in December 1948 by Rudolf Nissen of, of Nissen's fundoplication fame. And when Nissen was operating on Einstein, he was inside his abdomen, he coincidentally found that Einstein had an abdominal aortic aneurysm. So while he was there, Nissen thought he would, uh, Nissen thought he would address this aneurysm and he wrapped it in cellophane. And the idea with that was that he, he was going to in, induce fibrosis in the aneurysm wall and that would then strengthen it against future, future rupture. And on discharge from hospital, Einstein was photographed by the waiting press with his tongue sticking out of them. And he subsequently cut that out of one of his newspapers and autographed it and sent a copy to Nissen with the inscription, to Nissen my tummy, the world my tongue. Seven years later, 17th of April 1955, Einstein was admitted to uh, Penn Medicine Princeton Medical Center when his abdominal aortic aneurysm had ruptured. Nissen's repair hadn't worked. At that point, Einstein refused surgery and he died the next morning at the age of 76. On the 12th of November 2015, at the age of 87, Sir Bruce Forsyth underwent planned surgery for an abdominal aortic aneurysm with an EVA, an endovascular aneurysm repair. Uh, and in fact, he made no further public appearances after that point, with his health in gradual decline. 26th of February 2017, he was admitted to hospital with a severe chest infection, spending five days in intensive care. He died at home on the 18th of August that year from pneumonia at the age of 89. Fast forward to autumn 2020, an ex Scotland international football manager Craig Brown, who was at that stage 80, was alone in his flat when he became suddenly unwell with sweating and vomiting. He assumed, as you would in autumn 2020, that he had COVID. So he phoned 111 and was number 41 in the queue. By the time he reached number 32 in the queue, he was feeling worse. So he put the phone down and he called 999 instead. On arrival, the ambulance crew had some good news and they had some bad news. On the positive side, he tested negative for COVID, but unfortunately what he actually had was a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. And while they were chatting to him, the ambulance crew actually told Brown that they'd taken 24 similar patients to the hospital in the preceding three years and that 21 of them had died. Brown was lucky. He got to hospital, he underwent immediate open repair and he survived and he's still alive to this day. As a side note, I think if I was to offer feedback to those paramedics, I would say that one positive was that they made the correct diagnosis. They didn't let the spectre of COVID cloud their judgment. They recognized that Brown needed urgent surgical intervention and they got him to hospital quickly for that. If I were to offer some Positive criticism, uh, thinking about how they told him only three of the 24 patients they'd seen with this condition had survived, I might perhaps offer some suggestions on communication skills. So what do we learn from the stories of these three abdominal aortic aneurysm examples? Well, it probably hasn't escaped your attention that these were three older white men. And that's no coincidence because this is a condition predominantly affecting just that demographic. Uh, 
The other observation I would make about these gentlemen is that it was actually quite difficult for me to find people who were in the public eye who've been affected by aneurysms. More so even than famous people affected by aortic dissections or thoracic aortic aneurysms, and certainly more so than, than people, famous people whose cancer stories, for example, have, have been played out in the public eye. It really isn't a condition that is generally high in the public consciousness. And perhaps the reason that abdominal aortic aneurysms don't feature that high in public consciousness is precisely because of the demographic affected. Or perhaps it's because deaths from abdominal aortic aneurysms are gradually uh, decreasing over time. There's been a marked um, improvement in aortic aneurysm survival over the last 20 years or so. And the reasons for this are probably multifactorial, but they likely include an actual reduction in the prevalence of the condition per se perhaps because of improvements in cardiovascular health. There's better pharmacological uh, mitigation of cardiovascular risk factors. There's certainly a reduction in cigarette smoking. So all those factors may be reducing the prevalence of aortic aneurysms. There's also, interestingly, some evidence to support the theory that diabetes is protective in some way against abdominal aortic aneurysm development. And we're well aware, of course, that the incidence of that condition is exploding. And improvements in survival may also be related to better aneurysm pickup. For example, the introduction of the National Abdominal Aortic Aneurysm Screening Programme. You, you know, we've got access to people's aneurysms before they become a problem. And of course, there have been improvements and developments in the way aneurysms are managed. And, and frankly, we're just better as a team, as a medical team, at treating people with aneurysms than we were even just 20 years ago. And, and a lot of credit for that has to go to the, the vascular society in this country who, who really spearheaded uh, a, a positive campaign to improve survival rates from abdominal aortic aneurysms. And that's, I think, the other thing that the stories of Einstein, Forsyth and Brown tell us, that there are and there remain to this day different approaches to managing abdominal aortic aneurysms. Now, we don't employ Nissen's technique of aneurysm wrapping anymore. One of the problems with that is that you can't actually get all the way around the aorta. So you, you couldn't circumferentially wrap the aorta to try and uh, mitigate it against rupture. You could only really get two thirds of the way around the circumference. And it doesn't work. When Einstein was first diagnosed, there weren't any surgical options. That was all there was in 1948. When he refused surgery in 1955, however, he was turning down formal open abdominal aortic aneurysm repair, which was by that stage in its infancy, but it did exist. So in terms of how we manage abdominal aortic aneurysms, I think the first question really to consider is, is when? When do we consider surgery? Well, obviously when an abdominal aortic aneurysm ruptures, like in Craig Brown's case, you would expect the patient to be unwell. Obviously, Craig Brown recognised that he was very unwell. They usually have abdominal pain, back pain, radiating down the, the left flank, left side of the back, but not always. They may just be shocked. In those cases, the decision's easy. If you don't do anything for a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, that patient is going to die. So the only life-saving course of action is surgery. Ideally, of course, we like to get to aneurysms before they rupture because as the paramedics picking up Brown noted, the chances of surviving an aneurysm rupture are, are frankly abysmal. So in deciding when to start discussing the option of aneurysm intervention, we unfortunately do need to look at a graph. On the y-axis of this graph, we can plot risk of death. And we can equate that to rupture risk too, because as the paramedics told Brown, you can pretty much assume you won't survive rupture. We can then mark the surgical risk of aneurysm repair, and we'll plot that at 10%, which was where it was historically um, and where the studies were done. Now, the risk of surgical repair doesn't really change over time, so we can draw a horizontal line across our graph to show that the surgical risk is a constant 10%. So let's then plot aortic diameter on the x-axis, and this will allow us to start to consider the risk of aneurysms rupturing at various sizes. And we know that as aortic diameter increases, the annual risk of rupture rises exponentially. And really, if you get your aneurysm measured today and its diameter is in double figures, then realistically, there's a 100% chance that you won't be getting a scan in 12 months time. 
On the flip side, for those of us assuming we have a normal diameter aorta, there's no chance of our aorta rupturing in the next 12 months. So then we look at the point at which these two lines cross, because this is the aneurysm diameter at which the annual risk of rupture and the surgical risk quoted are the same, they're 10%. And studies have showed that the aortic diameter at which those two lines cross is five and a half centimeters. It's worth making two observations about this graph and about the studies that inform it. The first thing to say is that they were based on ultrasound measurements. And it's important to recognize that because we know that CT always tends to overestimate aneurysm diameter or perhaps ultrasound underestimates. But for any given ultrasound diameter, the corresponding CT diameter will always be five to 10 mils greater. I think the other important caveat to consider is that these studies were based on treatment with open repair and treatment with open repair 20, 25, 30 years ago when the mortality rate was 10%. Now, obviously, now that the mortality rate is probably lower than that, you could, you could reduce your horizontal line and, and the point at which it crosses your rupture risk line would give you a diameter threshold lower than five and a half centimeters. But five and a half centimeters is our magic number. It, it's different difficult to redo those studies now and that's the number that all other things being equal we would first consider intervention for an abdominal aortic aneurysm. So how do we find people with non-ruptured aneurysms in the first place given that by and large aneurysms are asymptomatic and, until they burst? Of course there are a, a number of ways that non-ruptured aneurysms can be picked up. Some patients actually become aware of their own aneurysm they're either aware of a pulsatile uh, mass or a feeling of a pulsation in their abdomen. That's actually quite unusual. More likely if it's picked up on examination, it's because um, you or another healthcare professional uh, performs a physical examination and finds an aneurysm. Or perhaps their aneurysm might be picked up on an investigation performed for a completely unrelated reason. I mean, we quite often find coincidental aneurysms on CTs um, particularly because access to cross-sectional imaging now is so much easier than it was in the past and, and, it, and, it, and it shows up an aneurysm very, very easily. And then there is, as I keep coming back to, the National Abdominal Aortic Aneurysm Screening Programme, NASP. Now that began its national rollout in 2009, although local screening had been going on in some parts of the country for, for long before that. And, and, and Leicester was one of the places where we'd been screening for aneurysms before the national program came into existence. So in NASP, men are invited um, for a, an ultrasound scan in the year of their 65th birthday, and it's done by GP practice. And, and there are one of four possible outcomes if they come for their scan. Either they have no aneurysm and they're discharged from the program. They have a small aneurysm measuring between three and 4.4 centimeters. That's not big enough to need intervention, but they get a surveillance scan in 12 months. They might have a medium aneurysm, which measures between 4.5 and 5.4 centimeters, in which case they have repeat scans every three months. Or they have a large aneurysm, and that's anything measuring from 5.5 centimetres or above, something that needs consideration of intervention. So they get referred to the local vascular unit for further management. Now, about one in 100 men that we screen have an aneurysm of any size. Only one in 1,000 have an aneurysm measuring 5.5 centimetres or greater. So it depends on your outlook, but that's actually quite a low incidence of the condition that we're screening for. Now, we know that the incidence in women is even lower than that, and that's why women aren't included in screening, because it's just not cost effective to do that. Now, there is one way that you might think we find aneurysms that actually we don't tend to, and it's actually quite interesting. The typical patient I'm thinking of here is actually on the younger side, and they, they typically present to primary care anxious that they have a family history that puts them at increased risk of themselves developing an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Classically, they're in their 50s or sometimes younger, and they have relatives that have had abdominal aortic aneurysms, father, mother, brother, uncle, grandfather. You know, there is 
de- definitely something running in their family. And it's interesting because we do think there is a genetic predisposition to aortic aneurysm development. The thing that's interesting about this is that in those patients, we almost never find an abdominal aortic aneurysm. I think the other important point to make about those patients, or, or in fact any patient that, that presents to you as a GP, is that you don't have access in Leicester to ultrasound scans for that indication. So if you request an ultrasound scan through the radiology department in Leicester, saying I think this person might have an abdominal aortic aneurysm or they might be at risk of an abdominal aortic aneurysm, that request will get bounced back to you. So now if you have any patient that you think might have an abdominal aortic aneurysm or you think they might be at risk of having an abdominal aortic aneurysm, you need to refer them into the vascular department in Leicester. That referral then goes straight to a consultant who will organise the appropriate vascular studies scan within our department. And then we'll write back to you and the patient with the result of that. And as for those younger patients with a family history of aneurysms who, as I say, almost never turn out to have an aneurysm themselves. Well, for the men, they'll obviously be eligible for a repeat duplex in the year of their 65th birthday as part of the national screening programme. And for the women, I I tend to advise them to seek re-referral at some point in their 60s to mid 60s, just to be sure they haven't developed an abdominal aortic aneurysm in the intervening years, which they never have. But it provides a degree of reassurance. The ultrasound scan for this is very quick. There's no radiation, there's no contrast, and it provides reassurance. So I I don't have a problem with with re-scanning people or scanning people who are anxious about it. So that's how we find aneurysms. Having found them then, how do we go about managing them? Well, when I'm speaking to people about um, their aneurysms, I, I essentially break this down into a choice between three options. And I emphasize that none of the options is without risk. As we've established, Nissen's aneurysm wrapping technique isn't a viable option, doesn't work. But open repair, where we replace the aneurysm with a synthetic graft, actually remains the gold standard. So the open operation is the gold standard. The problem is that this is really major surgery. Um, there's a chance of not surviving it, as we've already alluded to. There's a stay on the intensive care unit and you're in hospital for between 10 to 14 days if all goes well. And then it takes probably at least six months to recover to your preoperative level of function and activity and independence. And more realistically, the patient will be looking at a 12 month recovery. They don't get back on their feet till 12 months. Some people who undergo this magnitude of surgery never get back to their preoperative standard of living. And, and you know, there's a percentage that require additional care at home or even can't go back to their own home. They require residential or nursing care. And this is the paradox of abdominal aortic aneurysms, if you like. They are a pathology affecting older people. And it's those people who are frequently not fit enough for the necessary surgery. If only there was a less invasive method of treating aneurysms. Well, of course, that we we know there is an alternative option to the open repair. And it was as far back as 1990 that this Argentinian vascular surgeon called Juan Parodi, with his radiology colleague, Julio Palmas, performed the world's first endovascular abdominal aortic aneurysm repair. And, you know, this is within my lifetime as a certainly as a as a sort of a doctor and a vascular surgeon, then this revolutionized the management of abdominal aortic aneurysms. This is a procedure that can be performed under local anaesthetic, indeed, as Peroni's original surgery uh, was. And and in this day and age, you can do this as a day case. They can come in in the morning, have their aneurysm stented and go home in the evening. It's even possible to treat ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms with EVAR if the patient is sufficiently hemodynamically stable, which sometimes they are. So you might reasonably ask then, why do we ever actually embark on an open aneurysm repair anymore? And there are a couple of reasons why we might not choose EVAR actually, one of which we'll come to in a second. The other is a simple matter of anatomic suitability because not every aneurysm is suitable for sealing with an EVAR stent. You have to have a certain uh, length of normal aorta um, below the kidney arteries for the stent to bed into and, and not everyone has that. EVAR endovascular aneurysm repair, it's conceptually similar, I think, to how they put a ship in a bottle. The stent is all folded up on the delivery system and it's passed into the aneurysm through small incisions in the groin, up through the femoral arteries, and then it's deployed in the correct position, which we can can ascertain by using X-ray. 
um, just below the renal arteries proximally and into the common iliac arteries distally. And of course, as you can see from this diagram, the, the aneurysm is still there once it's treated. It's just that the stent is inside the aneurysm and it redirects aortic blood uh, flow through, through the aorta and, and down to the legs without pressurizing the aneurysm anymore. The aneurysm is still there. So if at some stage the stent fails, if the seals against the aortic wall or against the iliac arteries or any of the overlaps fail or, or the fabric of the stent tears, then it's possible for the for blood to re-enter the aneurysm sac and pressurize it. And we term that an endo leak. This can eventually lead to the aneurysm getting bigger and bigger, and then it can lead to it rupturing. And the patient wouldn't know that this was happening until their aneurysm ruptured. It's, it's much like having an untreated aneurysm again. So for this reason, after an EVAR, we have to continue lifelong surveillance, re-intervening re -intervening as and when necessary to keep the stent uh, functioning. And of course, that's expensive. That's lifelong surveillance and, and re-intervention. That's an expensive business on top of what is already an expensive stent. And the stenting options are becoming increasingly complex. I mean, this is a scan of a gentleman I treated who not only had an abdominal aortic aneurysm, but actually had bilateral common iliac artery aneurysms. So he had stents that went into his external iliac arteries and, and, and into his internal iliac arteries to maintain flow there. It's also possible to place the stent further up the aorta, in which case you have to have a stent specially made that has little holes cut in it so that you can maintain perfusion to the renal and mesenteric arteries. So it's increasingly complex stents that are available. So now I did mention that there were three options for managing aneurysms. So what's the third approach? Well, personally, I think this is a really undervalued strategy, but it's one that I tend to put as much weight on when I'm talking to patients and their families as I do the procedures that we can offer. And that is, for want of a, a better description, non-intervention. And I really do consider this as a third option for moving forward. And as I said before, having been found to have an aneurysm, there's no risk-free way out of it. Now, if the aneurysm is amenable to a straightforward endovascular stenting procedure, then this might be a reasonable compromise. But in instances where there's no endovascular solution possible, it might actually be that the non-intervention is the strategy that carries the least risk to both mortality and long-term quality of life and well-being. So I really believe that this should be considered as the third treatment option rather than a default that we have to resort to if all else fails and we don't feel we can offer any surgery. So hopefully, so far, so straightforward. If your abdominal aortic aneurysm is anatomically suitable for EVAR, a procedure that's a day case operation done under local anaesthetic, it would seem to make sense that this is obviously how you should be treated. No big surgery, no 10% mortality, no taking a year out of your life to get over it, no ending up in a nursing home. Well, of course, you can't just assume that. And when EVAR first came into practice, we had to do some studies to, to ascertain whether what we thought was going on was actually going on. So in one study, we took patients, 90% of whom were male and who were anatomically suitable for a stent and who were physiologically robust enough for an open repair. And we randomized them either to the gold standard open repair or to EVAR. And as you might expect, the immediate mortality after EVAR was significantly lower than after open aneurysm repair. The problem was that we didn't stop following them up at that point. And there are two ways of considering what happens to people after they have an aneurysm treated. If you looked at what happened to them purely from an aneurysm related perspective, so these are people who went on to, di to die eventually because of some sort of complication directly related to having had an aneurysm treated, then what you found was that about the five year point, just as many patients had died in the EVAR group as had died in the open aneurysm group. And by the time you got out to eight years, significantly more of the EVAR group have suffered an aneurysm related demise than the open group. And that's because of stent failure, endo leaks, graft occlusions, all the things that need re-interventions. So that's a problem for us. What was also a problem was when you looked at all cause mortality, which let's face it, is probably gonna give us more of a real world view of all this. You also found that there is no significant survival advantage with EVAR. And that indeed at eight years and beyond, more of the open surgery patients were still alive. 
So what this trial essentially tells us is actually that if you're fit enough to have an open repair for your aneurysm, this is more likely to offer you a survival advantage in the long term. It's more durable. And it has the advantage of not needing ongoing post-procedure surveillance, re-interventions. It's a fire and forget treatment on the whole. So what then if you're not fit enough for an open aneurysm repair? Surely then EVAR is a good option for your aneurysm in that scenario. Well, as you might expect, we did a trial to answer that question too. We took people over the age of 60 with an aneurysm of treatable size who were not considered fit enough for an open repair because of their comorbidities bad heart, bad lungs, bad kidneys, whatever it was that made them not suitable for open repair, but who were anatomically suitable for an EVAR. And we randomised them. We randomised them to treatment with EVAR or no treatment, remembering the strategy that I espoused just a few moments ago. Well, better news here. As you might expect, less of the patients who had their aneurysms treated died from an aneurysm-related problem. So essentially, less patients ruptured in the EVAR group than those who had no intervention. The problem comes when you look at the real-world picture of all-cause mortality. And when you look at three years after randomization, half the patients in each group have already died. The bottom line here is that these patients never really were destined to have an issue with their aneurysm. What did for them in the end was the comorbidity that had made them unfit for open surgery in the first place. And just because you could stop their aneurysms bursting, in the grand scheme of things, you didn't actually save any lives. So this is somewhat controversial, and sooner or later it was bound to come across the desk of NICE, and indeed it did two or three years ago. Now you're probably aware that NICE, uh, the, the NICE process is very systematic, they have quite arbitrary rules as to what evidence they can and cannot consider. And the view of the committee that were looking at abdominal aortic aneurysms was that there was essentially no place for EVAR in the management of non-ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms. The use of EVAR in ruptured situations is slightly different. There is good evidence of a survival benefit and an advantage in that situation. And in fairness to the NICE committee, you can see why they came up to, with the idea that there was no role for EVAR. It is the logical con conclusion of the two trials we just looked at and, and, and some of the other trials that were done. Essentially, if you're fit enough for an open repair, that's what you should have, because that's the most durable option. And if you're not fit enough for an open repair, you shouldn't have any treatment because your aneurysm is not ever actually going to be a problem. So when the draft guidelines stating this were disseminated to various stakeholders, as is the NICE process, it's fair to say that for a number of reasons there was an outcry. Uh, and indeed the response from all the stakeholders extended to over 700 pages. And arguments ranged from the fact that there were flaws in the original trials, the fact that the stent technology used in the original trials is now outdated and the modern stents perform so much better, the fact that patient choice wasn't being taken into account uh, and the fact that some of the negative aspects of open repair weren't appropriately accounted for. And the list goes on, really. But the upshot was that NICE overruled its own committee and eventually they published a tempered down version of the guidelines, which included various provisions that meant that actually EVAR could effectively continue to be offered to patients with non-ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms if the surgeon and the patient felt that was the right way to proceed. But the NICE committee that drafted the original guidelines were incandescent with NICE. Uh, they were incandescent that NICE had capitulated on that. And they published a series of statements to defend their original position. And I think that's a state of affairs that's never been previously witnessed in the history of NICE. And I'm not sure it did much for the reputation of my specialty, if I'm honest. The upshot of it all is that Sir Bruce Forsyth, who had his aneurysm treated with EVAR in 2015 at the age of 87, and who then died at the age of 89 two years later from pneumonia, could still have the same treatment today and probably would still have the same treatment today. Thanks very much.